my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Britax Child Safety, Inc. For over 50 years, Britax has been focused on safety you can trust from the very first day. They welcome new moms and dads to parenthood with award-winning car seats and strollers for every lifestyle while providing extra confidence for the journey ahead. At the end of today's episode, I spoke with Britax safety advocate, Sarah Tilton, all about preparing for the first ride home with baby. Learn more about Britax products and safety tips at us.britax.com. Today's guest is Gaby. She has two hospital birth stories to share, as well as an experience with having a ECV to turn a breech baby. Hi, Gaby. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hey, Bryn. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Gaby. I live in Washington, D.C. with my husband, Luke. Um, We have two kids, Inez, who is three and a half, and Eamon, who is six months old. Like uh, many folks in D.C., we're feds. I work for the FDA and Luke works for the State Department and my life is about finding you know, time for fun things I like to do, like art and cooking and gardening, which is, of course, very hard to do when you have two young kids. Mm-hmm. You know, keep at the fight. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're going to hear both birth stories today. So let's start with finding out you were pregnant with your first. Sure. So we started trying to conceive the fall of 2015. It took four months to get pregnant. Um, so not super eventful there for us. Not, you know, not a ton to share about the pregnancy itself, except for um, uh, towards the 37 weeks, which I'll get to. Um, I did find out during genetic testing that I was a carrier for cystic fibrosis, which was kind of a big surprise. No, no, no family history there. My husband got tested and he wasn't a carrier, thankfully. So that was fine. Um, But we also found out I was having a girl, which was amazing. I was so excited to be having a girl. I had just knew that I wanted a girl and just it thrilled me that we were having a girl. And I'll never remember the very sort of unromantic phrasing of the email, which says, you know, the results are consistent with a female fetus. So that was funny. Um, (laughs) But I still was so excited. It didn't matter. Um, The other sort of uh, wrinkle was that I was starting a new job and I was around three months in when I started the new job. So that was a little stressful. And I tried to keep it secret until I was five months. So it got a little obvious by the end of that. (laughs) No one asked me, everyone behaved themselves. And, um, was fine. Um, and I switched practices. So I was, I started with an OB practice, just the same practice that my gynecologist was with. And, uh, they were sort of a very conventional OB practice. Um, and about five months I decided I wanted to switch to a midwife practice. I knew that I wanted to try for a birth without pain medication. I had no idea if I was going to be able to do this, but I wanted to try. And I wanted to have an environment that has sort of more flexibility during labor. Um, you know, allowed you to walk around more, not constant monitoring, allowed you to eat even a little bit. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I had started to do research and reading. And I and I think the main reason that I wanted to go with the midwives and try to go pain med free was just to try to do as much as I could to avoid the potential for additional interventions and, you know, leading to C-section, which I think, you know, a lot of your listeners have said similar things on other stories. Um, so it was my mindset. And uh, I chose a midwife practice. There's a bunch of midwife practices in our area and several actually that operate in the hospital setting, which is what I ended up choosing. And I, you know, for me as a first time mom, that made me feel really good. Like, okay, I'm going to have, hopefully have this birth experience that I want. um, But I get to have it in a setting where, you know, should something go wrong or should we need additional medical support? It's right there. They were very integrated with the sort of traditional OB practices there. So it felt just really good and right. Um, and I also decided to hire a doula, which I think is a super great idea if it's accessible to folks, especially for first time, because you know, my husband and I, we didn't know anything about what we were doing, really. So I was thought, you know, having a coach there that could help guide us and coach me and be an advocate was be super smart. Um, as we'll get to, we ended up not using our doula all that much, um, but that's for the end of the story here. So the pregnancy was pretty uneventful, as I mentioned, until around 30 weeks when they started to find that the baby was in breach pretty consistently. 
So the midwives recommended spinning babies and lots of other resources um, to try to get her to flip. And I tried everything. I was doing the squats. I was doing the inversions. I was, you know, getting on my knees on the couch and putting my elbows on the floor and, you know, having all the blood pounding in my head, you know, several times a day. I even tried moxibustion, uh, which was interesting and not something I would ever have tried, you know, in another point in time in my life. I'm definitely more along the line of, you know, slightly more skeptical about natural remedies like that. So it was funny to both me and my husband there. We were lying on the couch, me with, you know, a, a cloth over my face while he was holding smoking herbs near my, my pinky toe. So that was very funny for us. Didn't work. Definitely not the only ones who have been there. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. <laughs> that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, you know, desperate times. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it didn't work. Nothing, nothing worked for me anyway. And so the midwife started to talk to me about if I wanted to consider an external cephalic version, the ECV. And so we ended up scheduling it for 37 weeks. You know, as I'm sure folks listening know, this is where they actually physically push the baby from the outside of your belly, push them around inside um, to get them to flip head down. We thought about it. I read about it. It seemed like the risks were relatively low. There wasn't a great success rate. It's kind of about 50-50 um, for the procedure. So I thought, well, it's worth a shot. I you know, I knew that if she stayed breached, the likelihood of a C-section was going to be high. We didn't even really get down the road with it that far with the midwives there. I think one OB at the hospital where I delivered had done breach deliveries before, but you know, they weren't you know, super excited about the idea of delivering me breach. So we decided to try for the version. And, you know, I tried to do my research, but nothing I had read or seen really fully prepared me for the experience. Um, They check you into the hospital because, of course, you know, if anything were to go wrong on the small chance, they want to be able to move you to the um, uh, OR immediately to get a C-section. So they check me in and they and I had to wait because the um, the guy who was the OB on call to do the procedure kept getting called into other emergency C-sections and the like. So finally, after hours, they came to me, and the midwife uh, was a rock star that day with me. She uh, looked at me in the eye, and she's told me, this is going to hurt a lot. And that was the first time I ever sort of fully appreciated how painful this was going to be. It was it was really, really painful. Um, it was excruciating. And I was surprised at how immensely physical it was. I mean, it took it had, you had three people leaning in with hands and forearms, onto the abdomen at one time, pushing, pushing her around to flip it. It was, it was medieval really. Um, and, 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 and yeah, really painful. And it took them three times to do it. Um, and the midwife, as I mentioned, was amazing. She kept the environment super calm. She was super focused on me, holding my hand, talking directly to me, just keeping my attention and keeping me calm. And I really don't know that I could have gotten through that without her. Uh, at one point, actually, the fetal monitor started to have a hard time getting the heartbeat, and my husband was convinced they were going to have to rush me to the OR. But the midwife, she was so calm, she just grabbed a stethoscope, plunked it right on my belly, and just quietly listened and counted out the heartbeats on her hand, and then everything was okay. It was just the troublesome monitor. So she is a badass, and I owe that, I think, success to her. I didn't know any of this, by the way, when it was happening. My husband told me later, which I was grateful to him for, because that would have made me freak out. Anyway, so yeah, so the very third time, so they did it twice. They tried to push her around twice. And every time, both times they got her almost all the way there. And then they let go and she just flipped right back, right back into the other breach position. It was so frustrating. Oh my God. And I could, oh, I could feel it happen too. You're like, no, oh, like trying to like move your stomach to keep her from flipping. Completely. I don't even know what I was doing. I was like, I was like reclined so far back. I was just trying to breathe and not clench. Um, so they said, basically, we'll give you a break right now and we'll give you one more shot at this. If you want to, it's your call. If you want to try one more time. So I thought, okay, well, we're here now. This already sucks. So we may as well try one more time if there's a shot and it worked. Thankfully it worked. They, they got her all the way around and she stayed and I was so excited. Um, and I, it's funny. I, th- I thought about that, you know, the second time around, if if the baby were to be breech again, would I do it again? I think I would have, but I really would not be excited about it because it was really, really rough. But anyway, as it was, it did work, and we went and had a celebratory spaghetti dinner afterwards, and all was well. Um, 
and she stayed head down uh, throughout. That is probably such a relief at that point. Yes, <laughs> it was a huge relief. Every time we went in for a checkup, I was just like, oh, God, is yeah, she back? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, and then everything went fine until the very end, really. So I guess I could tell about how birth went. Yeah, how did birth start for you? So I um, I didn't have a great sense of when labor started because I was one of those who got Braxton Hicks contractions throughout their entire pregnancy and and pretty noticeable ones, like from month five on. So the beginning of labor was not clear for me. I remember it was, um, you know, in the evening and they started to, I started to notice that they were a little bit different than normal, but I didn't, I didn't pay it much mind for a while. And in addition, I, I, um, this was about a week before my due date. And so I wasn't necessarily anticipating this was going to be real labor yet. So I also wasn't, you know, taking it super seriously. And perhaps I should have been because both my mother and my sister delivered early. So I knew this was a possibility for me, but despite this, we were just not ready. We had no car seat in the car. We didn't have a bag packed a week before, you know, delivery here, which is probably inadvisable. Um, Definitely recommend to your listeners, you know, put the car seat in the car at least a few weeks before your due date. We didn't even do the deep clean until like the day prior. So that nesting stereotype was super true for me. I just, the day before I, all of a sudden it was a frenzy. We cleaned the whole apartment top to bottom and I'm glad we did. Um, oh, another funny story is that the night of labor, I decided that now was the time that we needed to have my husband take nice maternity belly shots of me because we hadn't really done that before. I was like, let's just do it. We haven't done it. You know, we probably have another week, but let's do it tonight. Again, good thing we did that that night um, because that was the last possible time we could have done it. So yeah, so the contractions were mild. They started on a Monday evening um, around eight o'clock after dinner, and they didn't really hurt, as I mentioned, especially early on, but they soon started to get really close together, like only about two minutes apart by nine or 10 p.m. But the tricky thing with these contractions were that they were super short, even though they were close together. They were only about 20 or 30 seconds long for me. So that was confusing me. You know, even though they were coming quickly, I thought, what but you know, these aren't long contractions. These are quite short and they're not super painful yet. And maybe it's early labor, but I, I don't know. And I call the midwife and the doula and they sort of thought the same thing. Well, you know, it could be early labor, but just wait, see how it progresses. And, you know, just, you know, hang out at home. So I did that, you know, they said, have a bath, have a glass of wine. I did that, hung out and, uh, things were sort of very slowly progressing. So it seemed, um, I fell asleep for about an hour but then I had to get up because the contractions were getting pretty strong. Um, and they were, again, still pretty close together. Um, and they were starting to get painful enough that it was affecting my ability to talk through them. But again, they were still really short, like 30 seconds, even after you know a couple hours or a few hours of laboring, or even if it was laboring in my mind. And I'm just, I just remember being so confused. I'm thinking, Gaby, you have no idea what you're in for. Like, you're a first-time mom this is going to take days. You're probably not even dilated. You know, if you go to the hospital now, they're going to send you home. You're going to be one of those people that goes in and you're they're one centimeter. Not that that's bad, but you know what I mean? Like, I just have no clue. And I was just so, I, you know, I just didn't believe that, that this could be, you know, moving in the direction that apparently it was. Um, so I made it at home until about two 30 in the morning and I was laboring on the bedroom floor. And I, and I remember sort of around this time, things did change pretty significantly. The pain was enough that I told Luke, my husband, that we should probably go in because I wasn't sure I could make the car ride if we waited much longer. And as it was, getting dressed and you know into the car was really hard. I could barely put my pajama pants on. It took like 20 minutes to walk down the car. I kept having contractions. I kept having to stop. Um, Luke had to help me get dressed. It was just... It was a mess. And <laughs> they added to sort of the lack of planning. So we had we had bought a house uh, about a month before this, and our card was filled with boxes of stuff that we were going to bring from the apartment into the to house. So we we had to drive to the hospital with this crazy crazy car full of stuff, and then you know, later Luke had to go bring it over there, and that was really nuts. So again, not fully planned, not fully prepared, and uh, so we get in the car. It's really, really a tough ride for me. I'm feeling every single bump and turn. It's excruciating. And then after 10 minutes, we had to go back home because I forgot my glasses. Did we really need to go back and get my glasses at that point? Maybe not, but we decided we had to at that time because for whatever reason. So we went and got my glasses back in the car, 
worst ever. Um, get to the hospital, it's about 3 a.m. And the hospital where I delivered was pretty crowded. And so I, they brought me to a triage room. Um, they got me in there, got me on a bed in a triage room. And they checked me, and I was eight centimeters dilated already. And everyone was very surprised, including me. And just was like, wow, okay, here we go. Um, because the hospital was so crowded, they had to leave me in the triage room for about an hour. And that was the worst because they just, it wasn't, you know, the setup, it was bright and, you know, you're or with a lot of folks around you and people right nearby you. But they had me on this table. They were trying to get the heartbeat on the monitor and they sort of had me recline prone, even like pass prone, like my head was down below my meridian and they were, you know, shuffling the monitor super low on my abdomen to try to get the baby's heartbeat and they couldn't get a great read and they left me in that position for a while, which was the worst because it ended up being that's how I handled transition. You know, when I repieced it back together after the fact, was in this horrible prone position. It was just so painful. So I remember that vividly. I remember just holding my husband's hand and closing my eyes through it and getting those sort of contractions where one bleeds into the next a bunch and I wasn't getting any breaks uh, which was really hard. And finally, after about an hour, they came back in and they said they have the, a labor room ready for me. They wheel me in there and I get into the labor room and I, I sort of stand up and I, and as soon as I stand up out of the wheelchair that they had me and I had a contraction, a big one, and I hold on to my husband's shoulders and then my water broke movie style, huge splash all over the floor. Socks are soaking wet. And then after that happens, I decided that I need to pee. So I go and I shuffle into the the bathroom and I pee. And while I'm sitting there, I start to have another contraction and I sort of take it there while I'm holding on to Luke, sort of semi-squatting over the toilet. And then I realize that this position is so much better than anything else I've been doing. Certainly worlds better than the recline position I was in when in triage and I decide that I'm going to stay here and no one's going to move me and this is where I'm going to be. I just need to labor here because this is what feels right. And and I basically said as much to everyone around me. And so they they let me. They let me stay there. The midwife sort of turned off the lights a little bit to have be low lighting. She's you know coaching me a little bit through low moans as I'm laboring there. And around this time, our doula arrived. Um, it had taken her a while to get there. But, you know, recall it was only about... It's only been about like a couple hours since I first called her, and now we're here we are at the hospital. So she gets there, and we decide the smart idea is to send her right back out to move our car because we had double parked it. Probably, again, not the smartest idea, but she did that. Um, so she goes up, she leaves again to go move our car. So it's just me and Luke in the bathroom. The midwife has, um, you know, coached us a little bit, but then she actually leaves as well. Um, later, I found out it was because there was another woman in the practice that was delivering at the hospital, um, being seen by that practice who was actively delivering. So she had to go see that person. I think there was maybe one other nurse in the room at that point. And, uh, and otherwise it was just me and, and Luke and all I'm, I'm sort of hanging out here, squatting over the toilet, holding onto Luke's shoulders during contractions and then sitting back down in between. And I start to really feel the urge to push. And it is, you know, as so many folks describe, it's not really a choice it just felt, you know, it took over. I, I, it, my body was pushing whether I wanted to or not. So I, I remember calling out, you know, to the one nurse there and saying, I, I, I need to push. I really feel like I'm, I need to push. I, I'm pushing. And I, and I, I don't know if I, if I made this up in my head, but I swear she said, go ahead. So I did. Uh, I'm sitting, you know, over the toilet, hang on to Luke. I'm contracting. I'm pushing. Things start to feel like they're happening. Like, I feel like the baby is moving and coming. But again, I just can't believe this could actually be happening this fast. Like, I can't believe that the baby is could actually be about to come out. So, like, the same moment that my brain is saying this, it's also saying, you're crazy, you don't know, you're going to have 10 more hours of labor ahead of you, and it's awful, and, you know, <laughs> don't, don't think this is going to happen so soon. And, and, and I just was... I basically, these conflicting thoughts were both sort of drowned out by just the pure, you know, physical reality that I was pushing this baby out, even though I wasn't acknowledging it to myself. And, you know, I guess that the other um, people, you know, that were supposed to be watching me sort of didn't believe it would be that fast as well, because 
there I was, even though I was groaning and growling like a, you know, a wild animal. It was, it was just me and Luke and the doula. The doula had just run back in the minute this happened, I swear, when in one massive push, my baby shot out of me entirely and dove right into the toilet. So yeah. Oh my gosh. I had a full on, um, toilet delivery. Um, (laughs) So, so, so many things happened at once after this happened. So the doula who had ran in pulls the emergency cord in the bathroom. Luke reaches down into the toilet and lifts up the baby and hands her to me. And she, you know, was, was fine. We didn't know the time, but really all we were focusing on is getting out of the bathroom. So I'm holding my newborn baby. Um, she cried immediately uh, to my chest. And I'm walking out of the bathroom to the bed with holding her still with the umbilical cord attached, obviously. Um, and crawled up into the bed all by myself. <laughs> and in the meantime, 17 people are running into the room because the emergency cord got pulled and crowding all around us and we're getting lots of attention. But it was so insane. And I remember, you know, your adrenaline's already pumping, but man, that really kicked it over the edge. Um, I finally, I get on the bed, you know, with whatever hormone-fueled strength I had, just climbed right up there, had the baby, and then I remember getting the shakes so bad because the, you know adrenaline was crashing down and, and that was the that was scarier almost in the immediate moment than the delivery itself um but yeah we basically delivered that baby by ourselves it was it was crazy you know you hear about births like this perhaps but i i don't know less so in the hospital setting perhaps i don't know yeah it's definitely not what you're expecting <laughs> sounds no. like everybody handled it really well though i mean in the end it was okay um, yeah. but i Definitely had to do a little processing about like why that happened and ended up having some conversations with the midwife. Um, baby was absolutely fine. Uh, she, you know, Apgar score of a nine, they rubbed her off. You know, we delivered the placenta, everything was fine. But yeah, I mean, I just remember thinking after, after you get over the initial shock and amazement, you know, about that and also having your own baby and a first baby at that, thinking like, why, why did that happen? How did that happen? How did no one? A, tell me not to push over the toilet, you know? I mean, just come on. <laughs> it was probably not wise. Um, maybe someone should have tried to get me off the toilet. Um, and, uh, and you know, or, or just, you know, I was eight centimeters when I came in. Someone should have, you know, maybe checked a little more. I don't know. I mean, it was, it was also just really fast labor. I mean, surprising, yeah. I think, for me, for sure. It was, I mean, we... I would say went to labor around like eight or nine the night before and delivered at 5 a.m. the next day for a first time mom. That's super fast. Not Mm -hmm. what I was expecting. Right. We were only at the hospital for like two hours. (laughs) It was ridiculous. Um, My mom, uh, I called her after and she helpfully suggested that we should name my vagina the Holland Tunnel. So that was a nice. nice. (laughs) Thanks, mom, for that. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So after that experience, did you decide to have a similar plan of care and plans for birth with your second or how did you move on to your second birth? Yeah. So, you know, after the first birth, I sort of put thinkings of birth logistics aside until we were actually, you know, embarking on number two. (laughs) Um, you know, I didn't really do a lot of debriefing with the midwives about how the birth went so much. Um, but, you know, so three years later, we decided to um, go for round two. I did decide to stay with the same midwife practice. And I really liked, the, you know, the generally the care that I got. And, you know, I figured there's no way that'll happen again, right? <laughs> like, there's no the way. I, right? I mean, at least I know now. At least I know now, you know, how it right. feels to be about right. to delivering a baby. And I'm not such a noob as I was the first time. And so I won't let it happen again at the very least. <laughs> but, yeah, I was like... um, seven months in or so. And I, I started to get this nagging feeling, you know, like things were unresolved. Like I needed some acknowledgement about what had happened. And I, I got the courage to bring it up with the midwife I was seeing that day for my checkup. And, um, she was very kind and she sat and she talked to me about it for a long time. And I think I just, I think I wanted some sort of an apology of some kind. I never, I never really got it. And I, I didn't really get at that conversation either. I, I did get an acknowledgement that there was probably a few failure in communication, you know, when that happened. Um, but it was, I think it was right for me to bring it up and I felt better and heard. And, um, and the midwife I spoke to was very encouraging that we keep talking about it and I should raise it any time. And that was helpful too. So I, I felt good about that. And, 
And it was nice to sort of put that to bed a little bit because I have to say, you know, other than the sort of location of her birth, my first birth, I felt, I remember feeling super empowered about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like I did it all by myself. Like we didn't, we could have been at home, you know, of course you can never predict, but like we did it, we did it all by herself and she was fine and and we did it. And I was just sort of amazed and wowed that that could happen. How was your husband's feelings about it all? Did he feel the same? (laughs) I don't know if he shared empowerment. I remember, I, mean, he I remember scooped her him. out of the toilet. That's no, no small I know. task. <laughs> I know. I know. And she, he said she was really slippery. I bet. <laughs> and like, had he held a lot of babies, newborn babies? No, no, really, no. <laughs> Not that young. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely talked about it afterwards. And basically he was said he was focusing on me because I was hanging my whole weight on him when I was having contractions. Mm. And so he was bracing himself on the um, assistance bars in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And so he couldn't do any. So I basically had to deliver the baby and he couldn't go in for her until I let go of him. Otherwise I would have fallen right. to the ground. So he, I remember he was very focused on like getting the baby out of the toilet. Getting the, and he was worried, you know, that she had bumped herself or something. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, they checked her out though. And she was okay. But I, I remember saying, um, you know, we could have done it at home. And he was like, yeah, except for the shaking part, he was super freaked out by the shaking. Yeah. And he, uh, he thought, you know, if that had happened and we were home alone, I, I wouldn't have known what to do. I would have been so upset. So I guess in the end, it was the right choice. Um, when, when for the second time, I know it occurred to me, you know, given how fast the first one was, could we do a home birth? Like, would we want to think about that? And I raised it with my husband and, and the look on his face told me that he was not super thrilled with that idea. (laughs) And I think, you know, he was like, but the shaking. So, you know, we ended up sticking with the same plan. And that's actually pretty much what I wanted to. And it was familiar, you know. Mm-hmm. So we ended up staying with the same practice. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and that was it. And thankfully, um, he was actually breached earlier on as well. But um, around week 35, he flipped down, head down, which was great. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have to worry about another version or another college try with the moxibustion on the couch. Uh, <laughs> he was fine. That's good. 35 weeks. That's not like, that's still pretty late to still be brief. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So I was worried and yeah, I was already I girding myself to do another version, mm-hmm. um, if needed. And, and, uh, thankfully no. All right. Well, how did labor start for you this time? Um, well, one might have guessed I would have learned my lesson about not being ready for going into labor early, <laughs> but no. Um, but you know, to be fair, he was a full two and a half weeks early. So he really got the jump on us. Like I was thinking, okay, we'll be ready a week and a half, you know, but no, um, we were really not ready again. And in fact, my husband had, uh, gone on a weekend canoe trip, not two days before I went into labor. And we talked about it and he was like, well, should I go? Should I not go? I was like, yeah, it's, I think it's okay. You know, we're three weeks out. Like that's very unlikely. Go for it. And then he gets back at, you know, two days later it happens, which was a little nerve wracking. He, uh, he said that his friends were, were joking at the time that he was going to get a call in the middle of the night and they were just going to see him dive out from his tent into the water and start swimming. <laughs> Luckily that didn't need to happen. Um, yeah. So, uh, the labor started very differently from my first labor. So I was having no contractions and just lying in bed, minding my own business. And all of a sudden I felt a little pop and a little trickle. And I thought, Oh, I think that's my water just breaking. Um, so whereas the first time it was, you know, huge movie style break, you know, an hour before delivery this time, it was just a little, you know, signaling, okay, things are going to get started now. And, but I had no contractions. I had no, you know, expectation that it was going to be tonight. Um, Luke, since he is now a seasoned professional at these things, I told him that this happened and that, okay, you know, looks like this is going to be happening in the next day or so. He uh, ran right out and installed the car seat, which was not installed. So he got that taken care of right away. Um, and we packed a bag, um, got everything ready. So earlier that day, um, I had sent an email to some friends asking about, you know, who could be on call to watch our daughter when we went into labor. I hadn't sent this email out yet. And I thought, well, shoot, I better do that because who knows, you know, when this might happen. Again, very lucky timing because, you know, just a few hours later, I sent the email out at 10. I'm on the phone with my friend Tiffany asking her to come over to watch my daughter. I remember being particularly stressed out about the daughter logistics because we don't have family in town. So it's not easy to just sort of call somebody up and know how to get to somebody. And 
and I was stressed out about when I should, you know, wake my poor friend up, you know, at two or three in the morning to drag her over here. And, and it just added, it definitely added to the stress for me. Um, but finally, you know, we got her over here, you know, again, I had the Braxton Hicks again this time. And so it was very sort of mild uptick. Um, and we got, I got to about, you know, two in the morning before I thought, you know, we should probably go in just knowing my history. And my midwife had said, you know, in our penultimate visit, you know, put some towels in the car, you know, just in case, put some water in the car, just in case you don't want to have a car baby, but just in case, you know, be prepared. So, and she definitely said, you know, as soon as you start really getting contracts, you should just, you should just come in. So I ended up, um, getting my friend over and we went in at around three in the morning, um, and got to, well, three thirty actually. We got to the hospital around four. I was six centimeters at that time, but very stretchy, according to the midwife. So, in a uh, hilarious slash dubious twist of fate, um, the midwife was the same midwife that was on call um, to deliver my daughter. Or should I say, you know, she didn't deliver my daughter, but she was the same one, um, the same midwife on call. And uh, her colleague, who I had done a lot of my um, prenatal care with, joked afterwards that it was a moment of redemption that she. Uh, got to deliver my son and she never left the room the entire time, her and two nurses and coached me through the delivery, um, which was not long. So we got in at four and he was delivered at five. So less than an hour or so before he came out. So from six centimeters to delivery, yeah, it was fast. And I remember it was like, I didn't, I had no payments the second time either. And I remember thinking after my first birth, okay, that was hard that was painful, but I could do it again. Like I didn't feel panicked. It felt right to the extent that, you know, that sort of pain can feel right. But this time was different. It hurt a lot more, at least uh, than I remembered it hurting. Um, and maybe it was because they had me on my side to deliver this time, or maybe it was because it just progressed so much more quickly from, you know, six centimeters to delivery in less than an hour. So I sort of got to handle transition and delivery all in one fell swoop. And yeah, it hurt a lot. Um, but, you know, at least I was glad that I had already decided that we were going to be done after two kids. So <laughs> the next one won't be five minute labor. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, we're done. Because if this had been my first experience, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what the second labor would have looked like yeah. on um, that. Yeah. All right. So how was your postpartum experience with both of them? It was relatively, relatively good for both of them. For both babies, I had um, a good amount of engorgement, um, more so for my second than for my first they, you know, my, my breasts were just ooh, so hard. They, I felt like at one point at the worst of it, they looked like squares on my body because they were just compressing onto each other, which was kind of horrible. Um, thankfully it was short lived both cases. I had lactation consultants come in both times to help with sort of strategies to manage it, but it's such a catch 22, you know, to pump or not to pump, because of course, the more you pump, the more you're telling your breasts to produce milk. Um, but then if you don't do it, you're, you know, setting yourself up to potentially have a risk of mastitis and the like. So it was really um, tough for a while there. But I had a very helpful lactation consultant that coached me through sort of some tactical pumping and then laying off. And I used, I often used this um, this new um, sort of um, latent pumping tool called the Haka, which you probably know all about. Um, it's basically like a little suction cup that you can stick on your breast and mm-hmm. it will passively collect the milk that comes out when you're pumping or nursing on the other side. It was great. I feel like it has a little cult following now. It didn't exist, or at least that I knew of when I had my first kid. Yeah, I used the Milky's Milk Saver with my first two, and yeah. then everybody was talking about the Haka. So I had both with my third, and they're just really different. The Milky's kind of fits in your bra and does the same thing. So for me, I right. like that one better because I'm pretty large-chested, and having like another thing like hanging off was a lot totally <laughs> and I leak so much that I would have to take the milkies like in the car and like to restaurants yeah. and stuff like that so like I needed it on the go as well even you, you know, milkies a month later so I like that one better but I know some people are huge fans of the hawk especially if they're trying to get more milk like with the actual pumping right. motion so so many cool products <laughs> totally totally and that actually sounds like a very advantageous because there were definitely a couple of times where I um, left the haka on my boob while I was nursing or pumping the other side and it, it got full and guess what happens when milk fills the haka the oh suction stops working oh yeah <laughs> and, and it then just falls, falls off your falls, body yes. yeah, yeah which is sad on many levels yes um, <laughs> 
<laughs> at least because you're covered in milk. Yeah. <laughs> My gosh. That's not fun. Um, but yeah, otherwise postpartum was um, good. I, I was able to take off four months with each kid, which was very good. And um, the second time around was a lot harder balancing my daughter and my son, but, 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 but decently well and, um, and exhausted of course, but, um, it's going pretty well. And she's, she's generally a good big sister, only brief moments of insane jealousy where she turns into, you Mm -hmm. know, an alternate version of herself, but (laughs) thankfully (laughs) few and far between. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, are there any resources that you wanted to share that you haven't mentioned yet? I uh, love the Haka. I would recommend that. Um, I've always, I always love the Medela pump. That's worked really well for me. Um, and your podcast has been so great. I've binged it both times before <laughs> both deliveries. As I know you've heard many times, but yeah. it's so nice to have this as a resource just to hear what people go through and add to your mental arsenal. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. And people can connect with you by leaving a comment on the show notes page. But I really appreciate you sharing both of your stories. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you too. Now I'm going to chat with Sarah from Brit Tax all about the first ride home with baby and some safety tips to keep in mind. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on the birth hour today to talk to me about Brit Tax and helping new parents prepare for that first ride home. Well, thank you, Bren. It's exciting to be here with you and get to share some great information with um, caregivers and the expectation of their new little one. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do over at Britax? So I am a National Child Passenger Safety Technician and Instructor, and with that at Britex, I get to interact with caregivers at uh, car seat checks, helping families make sure that they are using the right car seat and have it properly installed, and just share information about proper transportation of their children in, in cars. Great. Well, let's jump right in. I know that when you're registering for baby gear, the car seat is basically the one item you have to have. It's like car seat and safe place to sleep. So I know people are always wondering, what is the best car seat? What should I start out with? So how do you help guide um, parents, especially that are thinking about that first car seat? You know, that's a great question. And being branded, everyone would expect me to immediately Um, identify my brand as being the best car seat. But really, as a technician, I would tell you it's going to be the car seat that fits your child, meaning that um, you want to make sure that it can be used rear-facing. If you're expecting uh, potentially multiples, you're going to want to have a car seat that can also start at a low birth weight. Some start at four pounds, some start at five pounds, and often multiples are less than five pounds when they're discharged. So just something to think about there when I say fit your child. You want to make sure it can fit in your vehicle, that you can get a proper installation and um, things that can affect that might be the contour of your vehicle seat or um, the front to back space. If you drive a small compact car and you're a rather tall person or um, both mom and dad that or you know the caregivers of the family, um, you might need a, a more compact car seat to start with, one that has features that you can use correctly each and every time. Uh, Probably one of the most important of of these items in picking your car seat, because if it doesn't have features that you can use correctly each and every time, it's likely that you won't use it correctly. And these are a one-time thing. We Just like the airbags in our cars, we need it to perform when we need it to, and we don't know when that's going to be. And then lastly, obviously, it needs to be a, within your budget that you can, um, you know, fit within your budget and acquire it. Yeah, I think those are all really great points, and it can be overwhelming because there's so many options. So I think the first thing that usually comes up for 
parents is whether to do like the infant seat that is just rear facing and you can have a base and remove it versus the convertible or all in one seat. Can you talk a little bit about making that decision? I know that a lot of the things you just said will come into play, but anything else you want to add? There's a couple of things choosing that rear facing only or that bucket seat um, versus the convertible or all-in-one type seat. The convertible and all-in-one type car seat will stay installed in your vehicle. Um, So each and every time you will have to scoop the baby up to take them out of the car as well as carry them, you know, from the house or wherever Um, to harness them in their car seat. But those types of seats do have longer use and higher weight capacities. The rear-facing only seat or that bucket seat gives you the convenience of mobility outside of the vehicle. Um, You're going to use them for a shorter period of time. Um, But again, they'll snap into a stroller outside of the vehicle. You, if it's... um, not pleasant weather, you can cover them up with a blanket and carry them in and out of the house. Um, So you do have uh, more more convenience and more more mobility with that type of seat. So it really then becomes about your budget and, you know, are you able to use the rear facing only and then transition to a convertible in all in one, uh, and some families choose to just take that financial investment and put it into maybe a um, convertible or all in one type car seat that has more features um, for that longer use. Yeah, that's a good point. As a, a mom of three, I got to say, being able to carry a sleeping baby without getting them out of their car seat, just if you're, especially if you're just running in and out of the store or something like that, it can be pretty, a pretty nice feature. And it keeps people from, you know, getting in the baby's face. Like you said, you can kind of cover them up and they're all yes. snug in there. So that's nice. Absolutely. All right. So what should parents be paying attention to when securing their baby in a five point harness? So when we're putting our baby in the in the car seat, and pretty much all car seats today on the market have that five point harness. And just to clarify what what a five point harness is, it's the harness, the straps with inside the car seat that holds the baby in the car seat. When we talk about five points, there is one at each of the baby's shoulders, one at each of the baby's hips. And then the fifth point is the buckle between the child's legs. So when we get that all properly around the child and the buckle secured, and there is a then a plastic piece that is often referred to as the chest clip or the retainer clip. Um, so we want to pull that harness nice and tight, depending on what seat we have, how we tighten it may vary a little bit. Um, But once we get it tight, how do we know that it's tight enough? At the collarbone area, we would not want to be able to do a vertical pinch, getting any of that harness webbing between our fingertips. And I always say vertical because if you do a horizontal and you go out to the edges of that webbing, you'll always be able to pull it together. So, A vertical pinch, collarbone area, you don't want any of that webbing between your finger uh, tips. And then that chest clip, you always want to position at the armpit level. And you want to check to make sure that that harness is coming out of the shell of your car seat when your child's rear facing at or slightly below their shoulder line. Those are great tips. I think there's some really good um, diagrams and things like that that we can add to the show notes page because I know you're doing a great job explaining it uh, verbally, but sometimes it helps to be able to see as well. Yes. Okay. And then what is the safest place in the vehicle to install the car seat, especially with first time parents, you kind of have all the options. And so people are wondering where to put it. Often the center seating position is of, of the back seat is perceived to be the safest. Um, notice that I use the word perceived. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that is because it is furthest from lateral impact being um, in a crash event that, that comes in from the side. And therefore you have um, a, 
a fair amount of the vehicle for a crumple zone before it would get to the baby in the car seat. However, if you stop and think about your the back seat of your car, it's often very narrow. Um, it has a um, hump in it sometimes in the seating surface. Uh, things that could affect you from getting that proper installation of your car seat. So we would rather have a nice, firm installation, doesn't move more than one inch left to right, front to back at the belt path versus being in the center. Um, So then the question becomes, is it safer behind the driver or behind the front passenger? And there's really no statistical data that says one position is safer than the other. Um, The only thing I I typically encourage caregivers to think about is do you live in in a neighborhood or community that you parallel park? Because you would never want to take baby out on street side. So often behind the front passenger tends to be the most common place. But safest is a rear seating position, any rear seating position that you can get a proper installation. Yeah, I think one thing to consider too that's not necessarily a safety issue is reaching back to like hand them their pacifier. (laughs) Where is that more convenient? For me, it was always behind the passenger seat to get that kind of diagonal At a stoplight safely, of course. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you about is the installation method. Um, You know, a lot of seats have the latch system. Some cars have it, some don't. And then, of course, you can install with a seatbelt. So is there a safer method? You know, that's a great question because latch, the lower anchors and tethers for children, were brought to the market in... 2002, several years ago, and it was brought to make installation of car seats easier. And um, unfortunately, it kind of picked up the momentum that it was safer. Neither a seat belt or a latch installation is safer than the other when you are following the Uh, instructions for your car seat, as well as your vehicle owner's manual. Um, And I say that because one thing that many people do not know is that the lower anchors of the latch system in your vehicle have a maximum weight capacity. Your vehicle seatbelt system can be used to the maximum capacity of your car seat. But keep that in mind, but following instructions, they're both equal. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to use both at once, right? That is correct for most car seats and vehicles. Um, you, uh, There is a car seat or two out there that says you can use both at the same time, but you also need your vehicle to be able to allow that as well. Um, so always use both vehicle and child restraint manuals together. And if you can't confirm that, the safest thing to do is use one or the other. Yeah. I think that's a misconception. Even with us, my husband's like, well, more is better. I'm like, no, you have to read the (laughs) manual. Um, And I think the car seat manuals are often very, very helpful and detailed, but your car manual might have like one page about car seats and you're like, uh, what does this mean? So yes, it, it, it can be very confusing and overwhelming, right? To the, the new caregiver, especially. All right. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions. If people have additional questions, the best option is to find a CPST in their area, right? Um, Yes, you can find a child passenger safety technician um, by visiting www.safekids.org and you'll um, see the options to find a uh, permanent checking station or a technician uh, that can help you. And also visit your car seat manufacturer's website. They have frequently asked questions. They have installation videos and you can always reach out to their customer service department as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for chatting with me today about this. Thank you very much. Have a good day. 
Thank you so much again to Gaby for sharing her birth stories with us and to Sarah for chatting with me about the first ride home with baby and some safety tips with car seats. If you want more information about Britax and their products and features and safety tips, you can head to us.britax.com. And if you want more information from today's episode, you can go to thebirthhour.com and search for Gabrielle's name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.